Good afternoon. Um, I guess I'm going to introduce myself. I'm John McNellis. Uh, thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this presentation. Before we get started, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you are in the development business today? A lot of you. Okay. And how many of you would like to be in the development business? Okay. I like to preach to the choir. All right. Another note. You know, I have found in doing this that the best way to impart information is through a Q&A rather than me just lecture. So anytime, interrupt me. Just wave your hand, uh, and we will, I'll repeat the question because this is being filmed. We want to keep the obscenities kind of to a, a low roar. But ask your questions in the middle of this. Some of the stuff is really obvious. Some of it might be a little trickier. Let's get started. The first thing I think everybody in this room knows, you've already figured out, is that nobody starts as a developer. It doesn't happen. You know, developers are like directors or uh, sometimes corpses. You're always starting out as something else. You know, even those who chose their parents exceedingly well, and I know some people did, still end up going, working as a leasing agent or a property manager in their family's development company. So, how do you become a developer? You go to work in a closely related field. You work as a banker, an architect, a uh, contractor. It doesn't really matter. Uh, developers come from all kinds of walks of life. Please note that five years. That, I'm going to return to that. And throughout the course of this, I'll give you just some illustrations on, on how I came to be here today. I started out uh, as a lawyer. When I was in law school, I probably thought a developer was somebody who worked at Kodak. You know, I mean, never heard of it. <sighs> but I, by as luck would have it, I went to work for a transaction firm in San Francisco. We had a pretty good developer practice. There are more seats. Please come in and sit down. You'll make me nervous standing there in the back. Uh, we had a pretty good developer practice. and I really wasn't a very good lawyer. Uh, in fact, people wondered at how I, I managed to survive at all. But I lasted long enough to learn a little bit about the development business. Let's go back to that five years. I used five years, still more seats up in front, because any job worth having takes five years to become any good at. So even if you want to be a developer, it's a good idea to work for the, at least the five years as, as an architect or a banker or an engineer uh, before you make that leap. On the other side of that, if you make that leap too late, you're never going to be able to afford it. It's almost axiomatic that you're going to starve as a developer on your own for the first three to five years. And starving is a little bit less life-threatening if you don't have a big mortgage, second car, private school, tuition. So you've got to make the jump fairly early. It took me a while to get started. I practiced law for six years. Um, before I began any real development, and for another three years after that, during that uh, quasi-starvation period, I continued to fill in blanks and contracts. I was very fortunate that my partners in my law firm, and I don't think this would happen today, but my partners kind of thought it was cute that my hobby was making money, so they, they let me do it. This may not be self-explanatory, and actually it's worth stressing. I think I spent the whole five or six years I was practicing law trying to impress my clients with how brilliant I was so they'd hire me. You know, even doing like Jedi mind control. John, we want to hire you as a partner. It, it just didn't work. Uh, part of that had to do with me, but part of that has to do with the fact there's still more seats up in front here with the fact that good small development firms are loath to add overhead. They try to outsource everything. I'll keep making that point. Very hard to get hired by a small development firm. So options, what does that leave you? Three basic options. The first one is time honored. That is, you keep your day job and you continue to do little deals on the side. This works all the time everywhere in the country. You buy a fourplex, you fix it up, you double the rents. You buy an eightplex, you fix it up and double the rents. Uh, you put a 30-year mortgage on it and then you have four, five, six of these and in 30 years, which unfortunately will go by like that, you've got a nest egg. You have a retirement, uh, and you're 
not a bad amateur developer. The problem with that is, A, you're stuck with your boring day job, still a few seats up in front, and B, it's just not that much fun. Uh, one of my partners says, uh, we'll never buy a building where anybody sleeps. Uh, the second alternative, this, is, this works, it's just really tricky. That is for you to somehow find a great deal, a big fat deal with a lot of profit in it, let's say a $5 million profit, that you can take to a guy like me and say, here is a wonderful deal, sir, and if you will do this deal and give me 10% of it and give me a job, you know, you can have it. That works, it's just really hard to find. In fact, any of you has a great deal where I can make $5 million, come see me after the show. <laughs> And we'll talk about hiring you. Okay. But third, and what we're here to talk about today, is starting your own firm. Let's see. Yeah. And when you start your own firm, you still need a kickoff deal. You, you need a deal to get started with a firm. But it doesn't have to be a monster home run. It doesn't have to have a $10 million profit. It just needs to tide you over. So what happened with us? After I gave up finally waiting for someone to recognize how brilliant I was, I went to, <laughs> that was a long wait, I, I went to work with a, an ex-client, a guy who was a very accomplished developer. He knew the nuts and bolts, all the stuff I didn't know as a lawyer. He knew how parking laid out. He knew where trash ought to go. He, he knew all the stuff, because I'm a retail developer. That's just absolutely critical. Uh, neither of us had a dime. This is uh, 1982, so 30 odd years ago. He had a shopping center site tied up in the wine country, Hillsburg, California. Traditional little barbell supermarket uh, drug center. And I said, gee, I think I can raise the equity, a million dollars, door to door, selling it at $25,000 a pop. And I have to tell you that it's like you're an actor in the worst broad off-Broadway play ever when you're trying to sell uh, a shopping center, an investment in a shopping center. T to sell it 40 times, you need to make 100 presentations, and you just go sick listening to yourself make the same pitch over and over again. Uh, but we did succeed with that, and we still own it today, 30 years later, and we're about to pay off the mortgage. So starting your own firm, you need a deal. And here's the kind of quasi-bad news. It can't just be any deal. It has to be a winner. It, your first deal has to be a winner. And this isn't as easy as it sounds. Uh, this morning in council, at a session, the very first speaker got up and talked. This is a woman who, with a very large established uh, East Coast firm, she got up and talked about how a deal she thought was a home run, she lost $15 million on it. Uh, you know, and that happens every day. Sooner or later, if you do real estate deals, folks, and you, most of you know this, you're going to lose money. But if you're going to start a development company, that can't be your first deal, or your second deal, or your third deal. You blow that first deal, your family, your friends, are still going to love you, and they're still going to trust you, but they're going to think you're not lucky, and they're not going to invest with you anymore. Okay, just to, that's funny how that jumps up. Just by way of illustration, uh, there we go. My personal hall of shame, we call it. We've done 60, 65 projects over the last 30 years. That's a couple a year. We're really not all that ambitious. Uh, well, we haven't had to add a new wing to the hall recently. Uh, we did have three flat out money losers. Uh, one deal which probably would have been a loser if we didn't count for the tax benefits. And frankly, you shouldn't count for the tax benefits. Uh, and then several just break even uh, when we were doing institutional JV deals where uh, we worked for free for a couple of years. But had any of these been our first three deals, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be the guy down at the supermarket okaying out of state checks. You know, it's just, you've got to succeed on your first few deals. The good news, though, is that investing in real estate is a lot like uh, swimming with a school of piranha. Your investors are going to be happy just to get out whole. You don't have to make, if you just say, gee, I got my money back, that's a home run. This is worth spending a minute on. Um, from our standpoint, we have been, there's still a few more seats, guys, in the front. Uh, 
we have been very consistent for the last, oh, 20 years, developing pretty much nothing but 50 to 100, 150,000 foot neighborhood s shopping centers. And that's like five to $15 million in cost. Uh, one reason we do that, and I'll stress this later, is that we're competitive. Another reason is because sooner or later you're gonna lose money. If every deal you do is more or less the, the same price, more or less the same potential profit range, then that eighth or ninth deal is not gonna take you down. If on the other hand, and this is a, a pandemic illness in the development community, if every deal you do is larger than the preceding deal, sooner or later, you are going to be the richest developer in the whole world, or you're going to go broke. Or you might be the richest developer in the whole world and then go broke. Oops, let's come back to this one. How many of you have heard of Olympia in York? Show of hands, just a, I'm blind, a little bit higher. Okay, maybe 10% of you. 30 years ago, Olympia in York was the biggest office developer in the country. They were everywhere. They were the most, it's the Reichman family out of Toronto, the Reichman brothers. They were the best developers. They built the finest projects. They built the, uh, the World Financial Center in New York City. 30 years ago, those guys were worth 10 billion, which today, you know, is maybe 30 billion. 10 billion, still a lot of money. But three years later, they developed the Canary Wharf. Everybody know the Canary Wharf in London? Fabulous project now, not so fabulous when it opened. They developed it into the heart of the, the prior Great Recession, the one that started in 1991. They were totally overextended. They lost everything, everything. Paul Reichman just died, and Paul was the, the uh, leader of the three brothers. New York Times called it, what did they call it? the most astonishing financial collapse in history. They went from 10 billion, they lost 99% of their money just because each deal was larger than the next. Uh, now they did come back a little ways, but they were never the same after that. All right, so you, you wanna think Goldilocks. Um, size matters the other way. So let's say you're successful. It doesn't matter what you do, you build office buildings, industrial buildings. And let's say your, your range is five million bucks or 10 million or 20 million. And let's, let's just say you're doing $10 million deals and you're cranking out one of those every year. And then one of your college buddies says, hey, here's a surefire little million dollar deal. Don't do it. And the guy says, it's a home run. The problem with that deal is you're not gonna pay attention to it. It's like, oh yeah, a little deal. Uh, so then what happens is you don't sit on top of your architect and he or she will over design the hell out of it. Uh, it'll cost too much. Uh, you don't yell at your contractor. He'll get loose with his numbers. You don't sit on your uh, leasing team. They don't get it leased up. And, and you know, and I have made this mistake. I have given this talk before, given this same advice, and have ignored the same advice to my detriment. I just did a little deal that we shouldn't have done because I was bored. Don't do little deals. All right. What's a good deal? It's hard to say. There was a Supreme Court case, uh, Jacobellus versus Ohio, in which one of the most famous Supreme Court justices, uh, Harry S Potter Stewart, not Harry Potter, Potter Stewart said that he couldn't define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. Same thing with deals. <laughs> you know, it, absolutely the same thing. Uh, this is a 7-Eleven napkin. Uh, and we like to say, and this isn't new with us, that if a deal doesn't work on the back of a napkin on the first day, you know, when you're sitting upstairs having a coffee, if there is not a clear, obvious upside to the deal, immediately, it's not gonna work. All, you can have Argus spreadsheets from here to there, IRR runs uh, all the way to the lake, and it's not going to make that deal work. And if, you walk away with one little take home point today, I think you got your money's worth. Don't push deals, you know, it, if it doesn't work on a napkin, it doesn't work. Okay, let's say you found a little deal that's gonna work fine. You found an, an office building, uh, let's say it costs $2 million and you're gonna put a million into it and uh, 
uh, leasing commissions, rehab, and everything else. So you're gonna be in, in it for three, and it's gonna be worth $4 million. So it's a sweet little deal. Now you need to get money. My next advice is don't worry about money. This is, it's up there. Deals are hard, money is easy. You know, you know what investors are getting? I think you all know this. Investors right now are getting on their money. You put your thumb and your forefinger together. That's what they're getting. You know, they, uh, there's an absolute ocean of money chasing good deals. You can, if you find a good deal, you can raise the money. Where are we? All right, let's talk about typical deals. All right, there, there are an infinite number of ways to do deals. Uh, and we're gonna, this is where we're talking about the money. Infinite number of ways to, to, to split the deals, but you know, everything boils down in life to one or two things. This one it boils down to, to two kinds of money. Friends and family money, sometimes called country club money, and institutional money. And a small developer, uh, starting out is almost invariably going to go the friends and family route. May not be his family, uh, but there'll certainly be his friends. You know, they may be the family of his freshman roommate. And these deals haven't changed since Ramsey's joint venture, the, the pyramids. Uh, the developer gets a small, modest fee. The money gets a preferred return, a cumulative preferred return. And that's usually tied somewhat to where current uh, treasury rates are, you know, or past book interest rates. It's usually between 5 and 10 percent. And then the rest of the cash flow gets split 50-50, and the sale and refinance proceeds get split 50-50. That is the basic country club deal. It hasn't changed an inch in the, the years I've been in the business. The split, by the way, is for a full-blown development deal a serious development deal, a ground-up development deal, or an absolute 100% renovation, or 100% lease-up. This isn't a deal where you say, oh, gee, this building's 80% leased. If I just plant some petunias and paint the building, we can get it 20% leased. That might be a good deal, but your financial partner isn't going to give you half the deal. You're probably looking at 10 or 15%. Uh, there's not enough risk in the deal to warrant a 50-50 deal. The more expensive way to go is with institutional money. Companies that specialize in uh, providing developers with equity typically command an IRR. Anybody in this room doesn't know what an IRR is? It's, it's okay, I don't. Okay. You all got it, okay. They typically command IRRs of 15 to 20 percent. Very expensive before the um, developer sees any real profit. So the money is much more expensive. But the benefits to institutional money are, um, well, they're really pretty simple. One, there's an ocean of it. And even if you're a Rockefeller, uh, sooner or later, you're going to run out of friends and family with money. You just, it's too hard to keep that model going if you really want to ramp up your business. So the natural progression, you start out with, with your friends and family. You get three or four or five deals going. You get a little bit bigger. And then you are come to the attention of the institutional money guys. There is an institutional money guy sitting at, George, would you stand up, please? <laughs> okay. Here's, here's an advertisement for ULI. George and I met 25 years ago at this meeting in New York City. This is George Marcus. He's one of the most successful uh, financiers, real estate guys in the country. He just launched uh, Marcus and Millichap Public. He has Essex Property Trust. He is in the business of providing young developers with equity. So uh, as you'll see, I'm going to kind of call him the Antichrist as, as we kind of go through this. But if you want to talk to an, an institutional guy about money, George is right here, and he's willing to take your card. <laughs> but, that is one of the great benefits of ULI. You get to meet some remarkable people over the years, and the friendships are, are absolutely fabulous. I, I cannot, as, as a sideline, recommend ULI too highly. Okay. The other benefit, back to that terrible off-Broadway play, the other benefit to institutional money is it's a one-stop shop. You make one sale. You raise just the million dollars one time. 
and you're done. Okay. Oh yeah. Here's the, the not so good news. Even with the world's most honest, best intentioned partner, uh, whether it's a financial partner or looked at the other way, uh, an operating partner, your interests may be the same on day one. And let's say your interest and your lender's interest are long-term hold, uh, low debt, and you just want to maximize cash flow. You think it's a brilliant asset and you want to keep it forever. And that's how the lender feels on day one. It could be that's how the lender's going to feel on day five. Hell, it could happen for 10 years. But it's just as likely, Someone is, is going to have, uh, what, what are the four Ds? Divorce, death. A partner is often as not going to need to sell, going to need to break up this wonderful partnership, and as often as not, it's at the wrong moment, the worst possible moment. Uh, you're 90% leased. You all know that in almost every deal, all the money is in the last 10%. So you're almost there, and your partner comes along and says, gee, I'm sorry, uh, I got, I'm getting a divorce, I gotta sell. And guess what, I'll get all my money back and my preferred return, and you get a bottle of champagne. You know, that happens. And th what can you do about that? Really not much. Every joint venture agreement that I've seen gives the money partner the right to major decisions, and that's really, frankly, how it should be. Now, on that point, you're still better off with family and friends than institutions because the institutional guys, they get divorced and, uh, and die too, but they also get fired, they get laid off, they get transferred. Uh, there's a corporate decision from on high that, oh, okay, we, we don't like California anymore. California's overpriced, or we don't like Boston. Uh, and suddenly, your deal that, that you've worked so hard for uh, has to be sold at a time that you don't want it sold. Is there a solution to this? Yeah, well, one is you don't do deals. Two, you get extremely lucky with your partners. Or what we ultimately evolve to, you know, so three steps in this, from family and friends to uh, institutions to, um, well, we'll come to that in a second. What did I do? So the first three or four deals we did with family and friends, like the ex-partners of my old law firm. Uh, they, fortunately, those deals went well, so I kept everybody's attention. Uh, but soon enough, you know, I ran out of friends with money. I, I went to public school, so it did, that run didn't last all that long. <laughs> and, uh, we moved on to institutional partners in the early 80s. Uh, students of real estate might recall that was the, the go-go SNL days. In the early 80s, so 30 years ago, I literally was doing deals larger than, you know, inflation adjusted, than we've ever done since. We were using 100% of the savings and loans money. They were kind of throwing it at us. I had an older partner who uh, I thought he knew better. I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, these were big projects, very impressive to drive by. You know, I tell my friends at the gym, hey, yeah, that's my project. I'm like, wow, John, cool. By the crash in 91, they all went away. Now, it was our fault. But it didn't help that one of those savings and loans actually just went out of business. Another one, with a little more money, just said, we are exiting the uh, uh, real estate business. Tough. You know, we're selling everything. And the third, uh, they, we were all set to reconstruct a 300,000-foot center, a big project. So all the leases are signed. The last uh, institutional partner says to us, we're out of money. Uh, we're walking. And we said, well, wait a second. It says here in our, our joint venture agreement, you're going to fund $6 million. And they said, well, you read that a little more closely. And I'm sure it hasn't changed to today. No financial partner ever has a recourse obligation to fund to you. What happens is if they want to take a walk, you know, they hear the keys, good luck. And that's what happened to us on that deal. So by about 1990, I had an epiphany, a financial epiphany, kind of Saul on the, on the road to Wall Street, which was, it's better to own 100% of a million dollar deal 
you know, a crappy corner gas station, than 5% of a $20 million deal, you know, mid-rise office building, or 1% of a high-rise. I mean, the, the mass the same, the numbers are the same, but you get to control your own destiny with that gas station. No guy in New York can call you and say, you know, we're selling, sorry, dude, uh, get out. And you only have to wear a suit, you know, on Halloween, or, or, or when you... Or when, when you come to ULI. <laughs> True. So we went from, it's a little counterintuitive. We went from doing $20 million deals you know, when I'm 30 years old and didn't know what the hell I was doing, uh, 10 years later down to $1 and $2 million deals, uh, but using our own money, uh, carefully using our own money, and then doing deals by buying, selling, and mostly with the, uh, the good luck of the, the 1031 exchange. Questions thus far? Okay, we'll keep rolling. Here's another revelation. Oops, let's see. Wait a second. Yeah. So that was it. No partners, no problems. You know, there's a lot of guys in, in this building that don't like to hear that because they're in the business of being your financial partner. But uh, so since 1990, we've no financial partners. Every deal we've done. They're smaller, but, but we own them. Now, your best financial partner is your banker. Absolutely, your best financial partner is your banker. Why? Because I guarantee that most of you, if you're going to do family and friends deals, you know, you put your mother in the deal, you, you, you put your secretary's sick aunt in the deal, the, the documents are going to be non-recourse. They're going to say, you can walk away anytime you want, but you're going to feel morally recourse. You're going to say, holy crap, I can't lose my friend's money. You know? And your friends are going to tell you that, too. They're going to say, gee, I never read the contract. You told me I'd make money. So if you're going to feel like you have to pay the money back anyway, go to the bank. On a successful deal, no matter how much interest rate, uh, how much interest the bank charges you, it's way cheaper than giving up half the deal. You know, they say 7%, 8%, 10%. Who cares if you can keep the whole deal? The other good part about uh, bankers, especially those that are here, I mean, you've got some really smart real estate bankers here, is they are good partners because they understand the business. It's not like talking to your mom and saying, gee, can I borrow 25000 The bank will say, are you crazy? That is a terrible deal. So they're a good sounding board. Okay. So now, in our odyssey here, you've got your first deal, or two, and you've got your family and friends' money, and now it's time to start a company. And one of the first things you're, you're going to decide, you're running a company, is am I going to take in employees, am, am I going to own everything myself, or am I going to do partners? There's no right answer to this. We have chosen the partner route. I think most of the successful firms that I know are, are one way or another partnerships. I've been together with my two principal partners for the whole 30 years. Uh, one of them runs all the properties and the construction. The other one runs a company. And it, it kind of leaves the question of like, what the hell is it that I do? But uh, it, we've been together a long time. And e all the employees are uh, in our profit sharing. And uh, I have some of the highest paid property managers uh, in this state as a result of that. Somebody once said that a one word key to success is over tip. And that charmed me. It was actually, it was uh, Michael Corda said it about his, his father, Alexander Corda. Over tip, and that, that kind of generosity is a great way to run a business. Your service for a small company, your service providers are absolutely key, and I'm talking about the brokers, the bankers, the, the architects, the engineers, everybody you deal with. You want them on your side. You want them like today. Um, we heard this morning. You may have heard construction is going crazy in a lot of places. It's very hard to get uh, contractors to pay attention. It's hard to get subs. Well, the way you do that is you take really good care of them. You pay their bills on receipt. If you question a bill, you question it politely. Uh, and if you don't like the answer, then you still pay the bill. Then you just don't work with that person anymore. 
uh, speaking as an old lawyer, having someone question a bill, it, it's kind of like accusing you of uh, fraud. Uh, it, it's, you have to be careful about that. And then you just take care of your service providers. You take them to lunch, you take them to drinks. Uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive. You say, wait a second, I'm the big cheese here. They should be taking me. But no, it doesn't work that way. Oops, did I skip one? Yep, no. All right. This slide has three good little basic points to it. You want to choose a service provider who, and let's pick lawyers, it doesn't matter, it could be an engineer, the most experienced person that you can possibly afford who will actually do the work. So experienced, you can afford, does the work. You don't want to go to the name partner of a fancy Chicago law firm who is going to pull out his best china, you know, interview you and say, oh, no, here's my junior partner. And then as soon as you leave, the junior partner is going to lateral it off to the 15-year-old associate. So you're going to get three levels of uh, legal services. You're going to have a huge bill, and you're not going to get that kind of quality. What you want is, you know, you look them in the eye. You're going to do the work? Yes. Best way to do that is go with a small firm. And it's the same with the engineers, same with the architects. Uh, you need two. <laughs> People, you know, are on vacation, they get sick. Uh, people respond a lot better if they think there's some competition. So having, you know, two lawyers, two architects, and so on, and having them know about each other, you know, it's like an open marriage. You have them know about each other just so you keep them on their toes. Gee, uh, you, you don't have time to bid this job? Well, you know, Charlie does. Okay, audience participation time. Who's your most important service provider? And any guy or woman who's bound to become a developer knows this already. Some, I, I want some shout outs on this. Accountant, no. <laughs> your spouse? What, is your wife here? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to suck up to your spouse here. No, not your spouse. <laughs> Attor attorney, no. Who said broker? Stand up, take a bow. I'm serious. It's your broker. Absolutely your broker is your most important service provider. What did I tell you? Deals are hard. You th what do you think the chances are that you're going to go out and find great deals on your own? I th I'll tell you that they're really, really slim. What you need are good brokers, honest guys who are hardworking, and you need to take care of those guys. How do you do that? The first thing you do is you avoid the mistake that every junior developer does, which he runs out and gets a brokerage license, right? And he says, gee, you know, it's a $100,000 commission. If I act as the procuring broker, I'll, I'll make $50,000, and family and friends won't care about that. Don't do that. That is so short-sighted. You might get one deal like that, but then every other broker in your community is going to say, screw them. You know, you're not going to see any deals. Don't fall into that trap. Be loyal to your brokers. Make sure they get paid. It will pay off in the long run. There's your answer. OK, I give up the broker's license. Oh, so seeking out the, yes, sir. Uh, the question was, how many brokers do we like to work with? Uh, uh, I would say as many as possible. Effectively, we work with about five or six. Uh, in different areas. Okay. Ah, the, seeking out the listing broker. You know, uh, to me, you know, it's like it's like in all these uh, mystery movies. You uh, you follow the money. If you just follow the money, <laughs> you know, I don't mean to be cynical here, but a broker that's going to get a full commission is going to love you twice as much as a broker who's going to get a half commission. So. If you can seek out, you, you drive by a building and you see a for sale sign or a, a land with a for sale sign on it. And this can be a little tricky because the guy who answers the phone doesn't want to tell you he's not the listing agent. You want to be kind of hone in there and say, who is the actual listing agent? And you say, well, you know, I'm working with him. You say, no, don't give me that. Who's the listing agent? That's the guy you want to talk to because then you're dealing with him. He's getting 100% of the commission and you have suddenly gone to the top of his list of potential buyers. 
you know, I'm sure everybody's fair and honest, but if there are 10 buyers at the same price and the listing seller has only one where he's getting a full commission, who do you think that the listing uh, agent is going to talk to about the seller or to the seller about human nature? Um, here's some kind of bad news, actually. As far as I know, it's impossible to make any real money without taking any real risk. Sellers, and I'm, I think you all know this, they won't let you tie up their property uh, for very long at all for free, 30 days, 60 days. Any tenant really worth having uh, can't get out of their own shadow in six months. I mean, it takes forever you know, to get leases done. And most of the money for developers is actually made in the public arena, in uh, rezoning, in, in obtaining permits, lot splits, or whatever, and that takes a long time. So you're going to need to kind of get past this idea of I've got to tie something up for free until I get all of the, the pieces put together. Excuse me, that's very, very hard to do. And if, you know, the, the Red Sea parted, if there was some miracle that allowed you to do that, so you actually had 100% of your leases signed, and you had a b building permit, well, then what would happen is you'd take it to your financial guy, and he'd say, oh, yeah, that's nice, John, but you're not taking any risk here. So we'll take 90% of the deal. So you pay for it one way or another. Now, laying off risk. Like I said, you have to take risk, but there's no reason to be silly about it. You try to lay off as many as you can. Uh, we have, and it's worked out okay for us, uh, we have tended to make our mistakes on the, the cautious side. Um, and one of the things, we, we do not take interest rate risk. We lock up, you kind of think of ourselves as farmers, so whether it's a drought, uh, financially speaking, or a deluge, as soon as a property is ready to be placed in service, that is, as soon as it's 100% leased, we put the permanent loan on, or we sell the property. We don't float debt. You know, we're not an investment bank. Uh, and we think that if, on the day that, that the property is ready to be put in service, if it makes money at whatever the interest rate is, that's good enough. There are a lot of people who've made a lot more money, particularly the last 10 or 12 years, floating and staying down. You know, interest rates have stayed down and down and down. But, uh, <laughs> like the song goes, they say it'll kill you, but they won't say when. Sooner or later, interest rates, are, uh, it could be five, ten years, are going to kill you. So we just lock up everything we can. The other thing we always try to do is lay off as much construction risk as we can. Again, this morning we heard that uh, supplies are in short supply. Texas, I guess, has a horrible problem with uh, construction workers. You can't find guys to, to uh, lay sheetrock. Prices are going up. Wherever we can, we say, w we'll do a scope of work. We'll say, OK, you want a, a plain vanilla shell. Uh, remember, we're in retail. And we say, it's 25 bucks a foot. Uh, tell you what, we'll give you 30 bucks a foot. You take the space as is. You build it out. There, we, that way, it, it sits exactly the way you want. And most of the time, they'll end up spending 40, 50, 60. We have monetized our risk, and, and we're done with it. I try to do that on every single deal. On larger deals, let's say we're doing a deal with Walmart or uh, Safeway or a, a bigger deal, we will try always to do a ground lease as opposed to a build a suit Now, I'm sure a lot of you know that ground leases are economically not as attractive uh, from a yield standpoint as a build a suit because in a build a suit you're, you're getting a yield on the, the construction dollars that you put in but they are much safer if you do a build a suit for a tenant um, fresh and easy is a supermarket chain that just went bankrupt on the west coast if you had done a build a suit for them you are totally screwed if you had done a ground lease for them then and they built the building then the you're either way you're getting the building back but the rent structure is much lower much easier to replace. So we try to do ground leases. Uh, we'll talk about guarantees in a second. Here's another idea. If you're starting out as a, as a developer, don't go with your college buddy who's starting out as a contractor. Uh, a sad way for a developer to go broke is to have the contractor go BK in the middle of your project. So go to a guy with gray hair and he's wearing a suit, who's going to charge you, and your, your buddy will say, gee, he's charging you 10% more than I would, and just say, 
Yeah, that's okay, that's insurance. I know I'm gonna get my building built. Guarantees. It, I think I hear this every single time I come to ULI. Somebody gets up and says, I never sign guarantees. I heard it this morning. Never ever sign guarantees, never ever sign guarantees. They're a bunch of liars. People sign guarantees. Uh, and you guys, if you're gonna start out, are gonna have to. Uh, it's extremely hard, let's just say impossible, for a young developer uh, to avoid signing guarantees. Let's kind of run through the scenarios. Permanent loans, you can get away without signing a guarantee. The um, permanent loans have, they're, they're called bad boy carve-outs, as I'm sure most, most of you know, and they, they run 20 pages long, so it's as close to being a guarantee as you can get without being one, but they are technically non-recourse. Uh, even a brand new developer can get a permanent loan non-recourse. Partnerships, you know, putting aside that moral or ethical recourse that I talked about, partnerships, that's the benefit of equity. Uh, they're non-recourse. You don't owe the money back to your, your investors. Uh, so that's easy. Lines of credit, which we find very useful in our business, those tend to be secured or secured by so much real estate, you know, let's say you want to borrow 10 million on a line of credit, the bank will probably want uh, 20, 25 million worth of property to secure that line. So, and short of that, they're gonna want your signature. Uh, construction loans, construction completion guarantees, these are guaranteed by almost everybody, unless you're in the absolute highest ranks of development and that, they're signed uh, by the, the, the companies that have you know, uh, investment grade credits. Our approach, yeah, I sign guarantees. Yeah, it's like <laughs> AA, yeah, I'm a developer. I sign guarantees. We sign guarantees on, on a selected basis. Um, but we do so because our deals are really, really cautious. I, I think we're, we're kind of like more cautious than a crosswalk guard, you know, when it comes to our deals. Let's say we're doing a $10 million deal. We'll put $4 million of our own money into it. Uh, so we'll be looking for $6 million, and we probably won't build unless we are uh, pre-leased to at least break even or darn close. So our way of thinking about it is, look, we're not going to walk away from $4 million, so I don't mind guaranteeing the lender uh, uh, on the six. On the other hand, if you, and again this morning, uh, someone was talking about a, a high-flying structure. If you, the, the developer, have, you're putting up 5% of the equity piece, the equity piece is 20%, and then, the, then there's a mezzanine piece, and maybe a second mortgage, and then a first. So you've got a capital stack that looks like the Tower of Babylon. You don't want to sign a guarantee there. Uh, but they're often trying to get you to do that. I would stay away from that. Questions? Yes, sir. So the question, if I get the question, it was, how do I hang on to a deal when I don't have the experience to get it through to the end? Well, I, I don't, the question was, if you don't have a development track record on that first deal, uh, then how do you avoid getting diluted down by your investors? They're, they're going to say, hey, shouldn't we kind of mark the market here? You don't have the experience. There's a higher risk profile. I, I think the answer is uh, that you are going to get diluted down. Uh, you can, it, what, what I did, I, my partner was 15 years older. So when I was 30, he was 45. He actually had enough gray hair. And, and so I couldn't sell myself building a $10 million shopping center. It was just like, that's like crazy. But I could sell this guy. Uh, and, and so, but he got half the deal. You know, to your point, now you could bring in a partner. You could find someone to sit with enough of a track record. 
Uh, but query whether that's better than just going to the financial guys and saying, look, this isn't rocket science. I can get this done. You know, I know it's my first deal, so rather than 50-50, you know, let's do it 70-30. Make sense? Um, uh, second deeds of trust. Back to that capital stack. You know, the, the holders of first mortgages, I don't think there's any second lenders here in this whole ULI. You, you never meet them, but you have all these classy lenders here, you know, the big life companies. And no matter what they tell you, they, they, they may huff and puff, but they're nice guys. They never go after guarantees on a first mortgage. They just don't do it. That, you may sign one, but the, your risk there, I mean, I mean, you won't sleep at night for a while, but they're not going to go after you. Totally different story with second mortgages. They're in the business of killing people. You know, <laughs> they're in the business of loan to own, uh, and then they're in the business of filing lawsuits. Don't, don't, don't sign, uh, personally sign second mortgages. That I would say is a absolute must. Oh, we're doing on time. Oh, two o'clock, not bad. Okay, I think I, I've said this, but it's worth stressing. You know, we believe in outsourcing everything. It, it, you know, and, and what, it, but we also, we outsource, but at the same time, it's like they're in, the, you know, we, we'll, we'll throw a party, you know, our architects come, our, you know, our brokers, our bankers come. We save a ton of time on all of these contracts. I cannot tell you the last time I looked at a service provider contract. Someone hands me a construction contract, and we've used two contractors now for 20 years. All I look at is, oh, okay, the address is right, the gross amount's right, you know, what's the line for overhead and profit. All that other stuff we don't look at. So we save a lot of time that way. And I think that's really useful. Ah, this is one of my um, pet issues. I, I think everybody in the world, everybody deludes him or herself about something. You know, it's crazy. You know, people think I can run fast, I, I can carry a tune. And my mother thought that she could actually cook. It was, uh, it developers often think they, it, it developers try to, you know, live on their charm. They often think they are a lot more charming than they actually are. Uh, but the, those are all kind of relatively harmless ways to delude yourself. The one thing you cannot delude yourself about as a developer, especially if you're using your own money, is numbers. You know, you go back to that back of the napkin, and, and I've seen this happen over and again. So the little napkin return looks thin. So the developer says, yeah, market rent maybe two bucks a foot. But my little building, we're going to have a reflecting pond in front, or, or you know, it's going to have a green roof on it. So therefore, we can we can just bump that to two and a quarter in our projections. That is, a, you know, there are like multiple roads to to ruin, and that's that's one of them. Or you go the other way and you say, gee, I know expenses cost five bucks a foot here, but I think with our superior management skills, we, you know, we can manage it at four dollars a foot. No, you can't. The building's going to fall down. Don't lie about numbers. Um, this is uh, not all that useful for somebody starting out, but our best deals over the years, uh, actually over the last, say, 10 years, have been joint ventures. Uh, and those are actual uh, formal joint ventures, but more often than not, they're de facto joint ventures. Walmart says to us, hey, John, you know that little town, uh, Stockton, we want to go there, uh, and then I'll say, hey, how about this corner? Yeah, they say, yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, that's how it, it's worked really well for us. That's a result of the same thing I'm talking about, of nurturing long-term relationships and friendships. Uh, the only hard part, but it takes about 20 years to get that going. It looks easy after that. A few more tips. I mean, it's, these are all self-explanatory. I'm just going to emphasize again uh, the most important one, specialize. I think those of you who are new to ULI, uh, you probably have, have it figured out almost already. Uh, those of you who've been here for a while know it. Everybody in this business is highly specialized. All we build are neighborhood supermarket anchored shopping centers, 50 to 150,000 feet. 
So we are highly, highly uh, concentrated in product type. The other thing, they're all within a two hour drive of say Palo Alto or San Francisco. So we're highly specialized geographically. In that little niche, we can compete pretty well. Uh, we cannot compete with, uh, biggest competitor in my world is Regency Centers, you know, they're national. We cannot compete with them somewhere else. Uh, we have a shot uh, up against them in our backyard, in our product type. Okay. Finishing strong. <laughs> this is my last slide, and then we're going to open it up to questions, comments, and, and George will be taking uh, <laughs> loan applications. It, once you have your firm, you know, well on the way, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to, it's, it's not that hard, start giving something back, and, and not just, you know, money, but your time. You know, every, every one of you, everyone in this room is, is far luckier than 99% of the people on the planet. And if you want to thank God or, or Darwin or whomever, you know, for your great good fortune, the best way to do that uh, is to give back to those who weren't dealt the same set of cards. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my remarks. I am more than happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. So, uh, Tony Gibson was on the market about nine years ago, and um, he made the story. He moved his firm to San Francisco and then he got fired by Sue Ethel. Read that. You know, he was only one of the first Okay, the question, uh, or more of an observation was that uh, th this gentleman has uh, got his firm going. He's into it for three years. He's doing deals in the one to three million dollar range uh, and trying to find an institutional partner uh, in, in that range. And so far, I think you're talking to the wrong people. I, there are people out there, George Marcus, go see him, who want to do Yeah, the, that's a good point. So it, it's hard, but you can get there. The other good part about that uh, is that the range that I've been working in, the, the, call it the five to $15 million range, is where it's most inefficient. You know, ab above a few million, the little guys can't compete, and below 20 million, the big, the institutionals who are here you know, if, if you're a, an acquisition guy for some big company, they give you $250 million, $500 million and say, go put this money out this year. They don't fool around with deals that are $10 million. So, 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 you know, when I was a kid, I thought, gee, once I get up to a certain size, then I'll start getting a really great deal. That's not true. The deals actually get worse. The returns get worse above $20 million. Next question. Yes, sir, in the back. Having it, so you're asking, is it a good? I think that gets tricky. Uh, the, the question was, is it a good idea to have one of your uh, design professionals be your partner? It certainly works, uh, but that can be a little tricky. If, if you're unhappy with the design, uh, it, I would prefer to, to not do that. You know, life's already too complicated. And, and what you're trying to do is, is avoid... Uh, potentials for conflicts of interest. But if you're starting out and he says, gee, you know, my fee will be 200000 but I'll, I'll do it for part of the deal, if you make them a limited uh, so that they have no control otherwise, so you have, sure, yeah, you, you could do that. Uh, we have taken brokers in uh, for, 
in the early days for their fees as limited partners. And that, that works. More questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, we're in the fortunate position. That the question was, do we get second loans from our banker? And uh, we're in the fortunate position of uh, we don't, don't need seconds. Uh, we just, the way we do it, um, we buy properties off our line of credit. Uh, we have a fairly substantial line of credit. So uh, the beauty of a line of credit is you don't have to go to the bank and explain to them what you're doing with the money. Because uh, they always, you know, you say, they're going to buy that. So you just buy it off the line, uh, and then we redevelop it, and then we decide whether if we're going to keep it, then we go put a permanent loan on, or if we're going to sell it, then we sell it and pay back the line. But uh, second mortgages, I, I, they're, they're necessary, but they're, they're tough, and they make life a lot tougher when it goes, if something goes wrong. So as soon as you can get away from second mortgages, uh, I would recommend it. Yes, sir. Yeah, we use our line of credit. So over the years, we've managed to uh, accumulate a certain number of properties that are free and clear. So we have these as our pool. So we put them up with in our, our bank, Wells Fargo, brilliant bank. Uh, Wells is our principal lender. So we'll go, let's say it's, it's X dollars on the line, but we'll pull $5 million off that line to buy a $5 million shopping center. Then we'll pull another mi million or two off of it to redevelop it. And then at the end of the day, say two years later when it's ready, then we'll either sell it and then pay back the seven million on the line and then keep the proceeds, or we'll put a loan on it and pay back the line that way. Follow? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, astute question. This you said with that strategy, doesn't that limit the number of deals you can do? Absolutely. Uh, I think I said 30 odd years, 65 deals. We've averaged a couple deals a year. You know, I'm just not that ambitious. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this, I, I just saw this. You know, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I, I love doing deals, they're fun, uh, but, you know, I, the, the, I'm not working off some chart. And, uh, and, you know, my company, I think we've added one person in the last 10 years. So we kind of live by this keeping it small and outsourcing everything. And it, I, I don't need to do 100 deals. Ma'am, in the back. Yes. So is the question, if it's a property that we have earmarked for sale, uh, the day it's ready to sell, for some reason there's no buyer for it? Uh, what we'd probably do there is, is float it. Uh, in other words, just keep it on the line of credit until we could sell it. Uh, we have found, you know, the whole thing about real estate being illiquid, that's not really true. <laughs> you know, it just, most sellers, and you guys will, will find this, thousand times in your career, they just don't want to sell at what the market price is. You know, every single piece of property in America could be sold today at a certain price. But, you know, that, that's a, the beauty and the discipline of the stock market is you know to the second, you know, what your shares of stock are worth. Real estate, you can lie to your, back to, you know, deluding yourself. You can say, well, my building used to be worth five million, so I'm sure it's worth five million today. Well, no, it's worth three. And so then it's illiquid. But I, I, I think if you, you want to move real estate, you always can. Uh, we've never really, you know, sometimes we've waited, you know, and to my regret, I've said, gee, this property's going to go up in value. Whoops, didn't happen. Yes, sir. That's, uh, the question was, uh, we do retail, why do we choose that over office or industrial or, or hotel or mini storage? Uh, it was pure fluke. The older guy that was my partner, he was a retail developer. And actually, I'd done a couple little deals on my own and industrial, and that didn't work out. So 
I just fell into retail. And I, I love retail, it's fun. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Yeah, I think that's a huge mistake. <laughs> Is that you've got all this overhead, right? Uh, and then th the beauty of our approach is uh, it, it's like staying in a hotel versus having a second home. So you're flush and, and you're staying in the presidential suite. Well, you hit a road bump, you check out of the hotel that moment. If you have a second home, you're stuck with that second home. If you have a construction department, I think what I, what I was trying to say, and maybe I didn't, didn't do a good job of it, we try to, in effect, have in-house architects, in-house contractors, but they're actually outside. The beauty of, of our approach is the moment that we don't have anything for them to do, we don't have to pay them any money. It is very, very hard laying off people. Property management is, is and we do all of our own property management. That's a tough business, a very small margin, and you can lose property management any day of the week, and then what happens is you've got five property managers who you like, who are working for you, and his mother needs a liver transplant, and you need to lay off. I mean, th that's the problem with the, all those employees. I, I don't like that approach. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get that question. Uh, yes. Right. The question is, uh, knowing what I know now, how would I, I do it differently with if I were, yeah, I don't know that I can answer that. You, you just have, you know, if, if each generation uh, didn't make the prior generation's mistakes, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of all bound to just repeat the mistakes over and over again. So I, I don't know that there's a great answer to, to that. Um, you know, ultimately it didn't work out with that partner. Uh, we learned from each other for a, a few years and then we went separate ways. But um, I, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Yes, in the back. Yeah, that's a good question. And the question was, how, how do we handle market timing? And the answer is we don't. Uh, <laughs> You know, California, and particularly Northern California, and more particularly any town that you really want to develop in, uh, Palo Alto, uh, Santa Cruz, it, it takes years and years. So I kind of feel like we just have to, to put our shoulder to the wheel and just push it through, and, and we don't worry about market timing. So our deals can go through uh, an up and a, a down, another up and another down, and we just want to... We just try to push them out as, just as soon as we can. We don't worry too much about that. Yes? Okay, this is a future developer. Yes, um, and that, if you, you can, you know, you can go on our website, mcnellis.com, if you want, but that's, uh, on that epiphany that I had in 1990, that was the other thing. It is very, very hard getting uh, political approvals on um, green, uh, old-fashioned green, uh, green field development, not green development. You know, the cities hate that. You, it's much easier to uh, renovate. And so for a while there, in the early 90s, not too many people were doing it. We were buying old shopping centers and fixing them up. And you know, it's, you go to a town, uh, that isn't San Francisco or Palo Alto, and you say, we bought this old dog of a center and we want to put five million into it, they give you a ticker tape parade. They say, oh, that's great, man. You know, here's your permit. So you eliminate the political risk. Uh, so I love renovating buildings. Uh, every time I would always rather, uh, and almost all of our projects have been that way, we do very little 
uh, edge of development, uh, greenfield development. I, I try to stay away from that for that very reason. That's a good question. More. Oh, yes, sir. The question is, you know, I, I mentioned that we prefer, uh, with our larger tenants, doing ground leases as opposed to build a suit. Uh, an astute question, will all the tenants go along with that? And the answer is no, they, they won't. Uh, some tenants, well, well, actually, let me back up. If you have the absolute corner of no and brainer, you know, the <laughs> you know, if you just have the, in retail, if you just have the, the killer corner, uh, let's say Union Square and, and in San Francisco, the tenant will do anything you want. But if you have a, a good corner in, in a cow town, the, the tenant will say, no, we will only buy. Like Target, for example, they'll tell you, we will only buy. Uh, Walmart will say, we prefer to buy. Uh, some tenants, like Ross, it, it's nothing but build a suit. We say, well, but we don't care. You know, and, and most tenants, really, really well-run tenants, make far more in retail. Uh, selling clothes or coffee or whatever it is than we make uh, in real estate. So a lot of them don't want to bother with real estate. Now, McDonald's is, is interesting because McDonald's is such a successful company and it's been around long enough that it has seen its operating costs go from you know, 1 to 10 when the lease is renewed. So McDonald's is really insistent on, on buying. But that said, I'm working on a ground lease with them, so it's, it's not carved in stone. More? Yes, sir. Hey, George, you can help me on this one. The, the, the question, if, if I understand the correct question correctly, it's the, what, what do the institutions want uh, with uh, an operating park? Stand up. You know, all the institutional investors, that, they've been drinking since Tuesday here, right? You know, uh, they, they, they talk. They, they, it's basically like, like they're bakers. You know, they're selling bread. They're, they're all selling it pretty much, you know, it might be, this might be pumpernickel, this might be rye, but the pricing's pretty similar. You know, somebody might have a, a, a waterfall, you know, 80-20 split to a certain level, 70-30 to another level, 60-40 to another level. But you can it simplifies out that, that they want to get that 15 to 20 percent return before you make any real money. And I, we heard that again today, uh, this morning uh, in our council session. Yes, sir. That's an interesting question. No, no I, we just give it away. You know, I, I'm not afraid of that. You know, it, the question was, uh, it, but by, by staying small and, and, and having outside service providers, are, 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 uh, am I afraid that they'll take the knowledge that they make from us and go out and go into competition with us? Something like that? Yeah, no. Uh, the question was, how small can the firm be? Uh, and the, the, a small development firm can be just you, right? <laughs> You're the developer. Uh, and and the, the, the next question was, do you need a, an engineer to oversee the engineers? No. You just need to pick, you need to 
investigate an engineer, find one who's honest and competent and, and uh, well thought of in the community and trust him. Same thing with uh, the architect. Gee, I love the way that guy works. You find out he, he charges the pretty reasonable rate, you trust him. I have a friend who's in the, um, uh, uh, he's in the, the institutional, he's, he's in the business of buying global companies and he buys companies from uh, marine uh, electronics to coal and coke companies to airplane companies. He buys all kinds of stuff. And I asked him, I said, how is it you can possibly understand all these businesses? And the guy said, John, I can't. You know, there's no way I'm going to understand this. He says, I just pick people that I like, I know, and I trust. And that, I don't understand engineering. I don't understand architecture. You don't have to. You just have to work with good people uh, who get you good results. More questions? Uh, over, yes, sir, and then I'll come back to you. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what, what your question is. I think that's right. Uh, but another way to look at it, the, the answer is, uh, the question was, uh, do, you, do you think the uh, institutional investors are actually going to get that yield? Uh, and I, in my personal experience, when, when I worked with them, and now it's been you know, more than 20 years, they didn't. <laughs> and I didn't. That's why when I said those kiss sister deals, you know, we didn't have any residual liability, but, but the meter was such, you know, let's say it was a 14% meter, we didn't hit that. So when, when the sale came along, uh, the uh, financial partner got, let's say, a 10% return instead of a 14, and we got, you know, a, a handshake for the, all of our effort. So I just didn't like that. And now, you know, sir. I think, in my experience, is Wells Fargo has the smartest real estate bankers. Uh, what you'll find in your career is that it gets very, uh, almost distressing to go talk to a banker and explain something just the way we're talking today, and they kind of glaze over and they don't get it. Uh, and they don't get it, and they're going to go to their chief credit officer, and he's not going to get it, and you're not going to get the loan. Wells Fargo has, I think, the smartest bankers, and they get our business, so I only need to explain something once. And they say, okay, yeah, we, li we like that, John, or no, you know, we're, that's not exactly, you want 10 years, we can only go seven. We get a quick answer out of them. I, I, I can't recommend them enough. Yeah. No, unfortunately, I'm doing all this uh, ass-kissing for, for no, no good reason. <laughs> but just, just, just tell them for me, okay? <laughs> Uh, 
right? Okay. The question was, uh, this young developer starts out with a local community bank. I'm going to tell you something you guys probably already know. That's where you start with a local bank, but banks have something that's called a loan to one borrower rule, and it, it's based on their capitalization. So a little bank, uh, the problem with a little bank is if you're successful, you're going to blow past that loan to one borrower uh, pretty darn quick. You know, the, their maximum total loans, like you can have 10 loans, but you can't exceed 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. So you need to make the jump from the little bank up to the next level. It takes quite a while to, to, to get to the right people at a, at a B of A or, or Wells Fargo. But ultimately, if you're going to be a real estate developer, you want to work your way up. Anybody but George? No. Three banks. Yeah, that's that was, yeah. I I included banks. In fact, I, I I write a column for the Registry magazine. If you want to read it, uh, it's registry.com, McNellis. But I I wrote a column on uh, having an open relationship with your banker. You know, just it's, you know, your banker wants you to be monogamous. You know, they want all. They say we want all your business. This is a mistake because the bank will come in and out of the market. The bank will, ha will come in and out of pricing. Ideally, you'd have three banks. You'd have that little bank that you start with, and then you work up to like a larger community bank, and then you finally work up to a national. But the banks are always changing. They're always merging. So I only, actually, I'd like another bank right now. I've only got two. Uh, but in the way, way back, Yeah, uh, the question was, can I elaborate on the fee structure in a, a country club setting? You know, what are acceptable fees? I think if you tell your, your family and friends you want a 1% acquisition fee, so it's a $5 million deal, you, you want $50,000 for acquisition. No one's going to squawk too much about that. If you say you want 3% um, management fees and, and that's standard, no one's going to squawk about that. Uh, for construction management, two to three percent of hard cost, that's pretty, so you're, you're going to put two million in it, so two percent, so it's a forty thousand dollar management fee. Leasing commissions, uh, then if, if I were your financial partner, I'd say, is that a good idea to have you doing the leasing or shouldn't I go over to someone who's an expert leasing agent? So it's, the financial guy is not going to be adverse to paying full leasing commissions, but he may be adverse to paying them to you. And he may be really adverse to have you skimming off that. Back to the point about pay brokers as much as you can to get the best possible service. He probably doesn't want you on, on the leasing commission side. And then, you know, so he gets the, let's say it's a 10% preferred return. It's a brilliant deal. It's a 50-50 split. It's a little bit piggy, but I've seen uh, in family and friends where someone will put a 1% uh, sale fee on, on the back end, too. Uh, but... I have found uh, that the simpler, if you're trying to sell country club money, the best way to do it is to say, look, I'm not going to make a dime, zero, until you get your money back. Then the old guy says, well, okay, gee, uh, you know, if, if he trusts you, that, that's a pretty good deal. Or you say, all I'm going to make is a management fee, I'll make 30000 a year, and I'm going to kill myself for you, Grandpa. Uh, that, that's pretty impressive. If you start saying, I'm going to get this acquisition fee and this leasing fee and this fee, the guy says, wait a second, this son of a bitch will make 250000 whether I get my money back or not. Much tougher sell. So put yourself behind the money. Yes, and the way, way back. Yeah, sure. If if you can, if there's, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we just did a, we just finished a mixed-use project where we put in uh, very low-income housing, uh, and as a result of that, we uh, were able to sell tax-exempt bonds, and, and there were some tax credits. Uh, we took advantage of that. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely would uh, do that. Folks, it is a little past 2.30. I am happy to stay to answer questions, but you're also free to go. I very much appreciate you all staying here. Thank you.